The digital art era is here. AI and art creation tools empower anyone to make it. Blockchain technologies allow anyone to own it. VR, AR, and extended reality immerse us in it. Let's talk to artists and innovators behind the visual magic. I'm your host, Roger Dickerman. Welcome to the future of art. Today, we welcome Slime Sunday. Slime is a provocative and unconventional collage artist who's released artworks through auction houses and platforms via Slime Sunday and Alter Ego Grime Monday and across collaborations, including Blau and Playboy. November 6, 2020 was a special date in the history books as Slime Sunday released the last stand of the nation state. In this interview, we are going back in time. We are reliving the moment and walking it forward to present day. If you are an early listener of this episode, you're going to hear details that have not been shared anywhere else on what's planned for its third anniversary. Let's get to it. Slime Sunday, welcome to the future of art. Thank you, man. Glad to be here. We've done this a few times. We've had the pleasure of doing this in the origin story era. We did this with Crypto Kitchen T Noble. Yeah. We hung out a little bit after that one-on-one. -on -one, and now here, I mean, we're building up years of a lineage here. I know, dude. It's wild. I mean, you've been here since pretty much the beginning. I mean, well, you're an OG at this point. I don't know, man. It's a, it's always era after era, right? It's the beginning of an era, but then you can always point to the X copies and the a lot of monies and the coldies. I know. That's so true. It's yeah. so true. <laughs> and and then even before that, right? Digital digital art in general, going back decades prior. So I feel I still yeah. feel like a newbie. Nah, nah, no way, dude. <laughs> so how you been? Good, man. I've been good. Just uh, grinding away as usual, trying to navigate this market, which is obviously challenging for everybody. But you know, like I'm an artist, so I'm just continuing to create continuously regardless of you know the market sentiment and, and stuff like that i want to get into that a little bit more because i think it's such a powerful perspective um but first i want to ask you the key question and that is what does art mean to you um yeah i i guess kind of a lot from like a personal standpoint like i i mean when i was a kid i guess it kind of started with just the music side of things like my dad growing up had always been in a band and always, you know, played music. So I got, you know, at a very early age, I started playing various instruments and stuff like that. And then it was kind of just like a form of uh, escapism, I guess you could say. Like growing up, I had a lot of uh, psychological shit going on, you could say. So it was a way of kind of just getting my mind to not think about things that I didn't want to think about and just like focus on something like channeling that energy into something positive. So I kind of got involved in digital art, I would say in maybe like end of high school ish, I started like experimenting with computers and realizing that computers could be used as an interface with for art, which was kind of surprising to me like you'd always think that like drawing and and stuff like that is like the main or painting is kind of like the main art form but using a computer is just as powerful and that to me was like I could never draw I could never paint so being able to like learn different softwares and stuff like that and then I had like a a moment in college where I went into like a a pretty bad depression and like art just in general just like completely got me through it like just channeling that energy into something else and you know focusing my mind on that was super helpful and to this day like it's still kind of like that where I feel like I need to do it like it's almost like a compulsion like I can't go a day without making art and if I don't if like if I'm not making art it's the only thing I'm thinking about is like when can I start making shit you know like the slime sunday sanctuary yeah exactly dude just continues i mean I, pro I probably spend a good 10 hours a day every day doing this um some days i end up with nothing and some days i end up with something it's a it's a fun process not knowing which well fun i imagine maddening at some at some time oh, at some dude. points yeah yeah <laughs> but then those breakthroughs must mean the world 
Oh yeah, hundred percent. Like it's if like not having something is the worst feeling, but then when you do have something, you're like, yes. And then once that moment passes, you're back to the point of like, shit, I don't have anything. Like I need, I need to come up with something else now. You know, it's like a continuous cycle. It's like a new meritocracy every single day. Every day. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So let's set the stage. Let's set the stage. There's a very special date that is coming up fast. And as I put it to you pre-recording, you, in my mind, at least you own this, this date, this general time frame. Um, raising my hand, this is my first ever collected NFT. And I want to, I want to set the date for you. And I would love for you to describe it in your own words, but if you could try to transport us back to this date and maybe the vibe and the feeling on the date versus reflecting on it now, which of course then we'll fast forward to. Okay. So Slime Sunday, the date is November 6th, 2020. And the location is Nifty Gateway. Set the scene for us. So at that period of time, Nifty Gateway was like, you know, if you had a drop day on Nifty Gateway, like everyone was watching. And I think the community kind of like, I don't know, it was just like everyone wanted to be there at the time, whether you were a collector or an artist, like everyone was kind of rooting for the person who's, whose day whose day it was. And this was kind of, I would say it was kind of the beginning of Nifty Gateway's like trajectory. And I don't know, people at Nifty Gateway have told me that this was the first open edition on Nifty Gateway, which I haven't looked into. I don't know if this is true or not. But at the time, it was like, what can we do that someone hasn't done yet? And that was the idea of doing an open edition. And we're like, let's do it for, I guess, like a cheap price point and kind of see what happens. And, you know, it ended up blowing up and I don't know, like what was it like 400 ish sold or something? 415. Yeah. 415 sold. And that was kind of the beginning of open editions. And then after that, like open editions just went absurd. People were selling them for like $2,000 open editions. Like, you know, it was like this thing just took off with open editions. And um, yeah, at that point in time, just like the excitement of, of just doing that and like kind of, claiming that moment was really interesting. Um, so I would say that you were the first accessible open edition. The first ever open edition, I think, is PAC okay. with, with their first release on Nifty Gateway. But it was, it was a much higher price point. And then there was some time in between. So it definitely was not popularized then at all. So when you did release The Last Stand in the Nation State, which was, oh, oh by the way, $40, that did feel like the dawning of of a new way of releasing an open edition in, in a very accessible manner, which it turned a lot of people's heads and it and it encouraged a lot of people, myself included, to collect their first NFT. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So Pac had one before. It was several months prior, but again, it wasn't popularized then. It wasn't like they did that and then the next day yeah. there was another and another and another. It was their first release on Nifty Gateway. It was, I believe, technically the first open edition format. Interesting. Okay, cool. That's good to know. Yeah, RD man. has let's, knowledge, man. Let's go. Let's. We've been around a minute. We've been around a minute. Um, but so, so I, I also want to give you a bit more credit because you said everyone wanted to be on Nifty Gateway. Everyone was watching at that time. And I feel like this really was a next step. Yes, there were major releases. There there was Beeple in October and FIWO in October. And FIWO had picked up a lot of heat from um, the Pomp newsletter, right? Anthony Pompliano's yep. newsletter. He had written about Fawocious, this up and coming rock star of an artist. And there was a lot of attention going in. And again, Beeple was Beeple. And the first drop was in October. And there were a lot of eyes on that. But I don't believe Nifty Gateway yet had hit the must see tv you absolutely have to be there every single night for every single artist that it did let's say a month or two later and i yeah. i think man you had uh you had a decent amount to do with that oh you think so man i do i don't i don't, I don't know i mean that's that's wild to think about um yeah i mean when me and when me and blau started with ssx blau um I don't even think people were really knew what and like at that point in time, and which was probably two months before I did last stand, like there was probably like five people dropping on Nifty Gateway at the time. Like, and it wasn't even like 
not many people at all were paying attention. Like nobody knew what NFTs were. Um, it was kind of like we were like even putting it on like Instagram where I had already built up a following. Like people were like, what the, what is it? You know, like, what is this shit? Um, so at that time, like it, there was really not that many people even in the space. I mean, me, the the reason that me and Justin got involved is because it was COVID and we were like, we're not doing anything right now. Like, you know, he wasn't doing his, his music and, and touring and my entire, every, all the money that I had made had been from, you know, like doing work for various musicians and album covers and stuff like that. And I had no income at that point because of COVID and no one was touring. So we were just like, yeah, dude, this seems like a good idea. Like, and, and Trevor Jones had had that massive sale and we were like, well, people are actually paying attention to this stuff. So at, that's kind of like when we got involved and then it's crazy how quickly it happened. Like we got involved, then people got involved. And I would say people probably is like, basically took it to a whole new level. That's when people started really paying attention is like after that people drop. Um, and you're so right, by the way, to mention Trevor. Trevor belongs in that dialogue. Then like the nifty gateway rise where Bitcoin, Bitcoin bull happens. That, that was an amazing moment. Like you said, then people kind of takes it to a new level. Fawocious comes in with the with with the pomp hype. Um, but what I think the difference among all of those things and what you did was, is as you know, as we're all well aware, sometimes the space moves on speculation, right? And there's a there's a large trader community. There's a lot of like dollars are in our face and, and Ethereum are in our face all the time, just by nature of it being a public ledger. You can't really get around it, right? Something that's always happening, but behind the scenes in a lot of other industries is very much again in front of our faces. And I think what was different between your release, The Last End of the Nation State and the others was price point and numbers, where 415 was a big deal back then. That was, that yeah. was it felt like a big number and $40 was extremely accessible. So you sort of had those two factors meet in the middle. A lot of people acquired this edition and I'll still, I never forget the aftermath, man. I mean, people were, people were buying and selling them for $60, $69, you know, yeah. right, right in that <laughs> sweet spot. And then it just kind of kept going. And that kept turning more and more people's heads to say, wait a second, you got this for $40 and now you're selling it for $240. Yeah. And, and that was a big, big deal at the time. And then of course it absolutely rocketed. Yeah, I, think it, I think it hit like 20,000 at one point. I just, I'll just remember my, like my dad selling it for like 800 bucks. And then a month later it was up to like 15,000. And it was just, I, I always give him shit for that. And, uh, you know, a lot of people did that. I mean, it's kind of like who would have expected it to take that turn? You know, it was $40. And then all of a sudden it's like, what the hell happened? You know, I mean, the, I was not expecting that. Um, for me, it was just like a fun, like, let's make this meme about the current crypto, the, the state of NFTs and crypto at this moment in time. And now it's kind of become a thing where I just plan to do this every year, you know? And you, you really planted a seed. I mean, you really did capture the moment. I think it's one of the fun, for me, at least it's one of the fun facets of art. I think there's, a, of course, infinite approaches to it, no, none necessarily more valid than the other, but, you know, one is marking history in place and time. And I think many of us will always look back at that piece and say, you know, it's probably one of the best time capsules that exists of the calendar year 2020, peak COVID, by the way. Everyone, yep. everyone inside nifty gateway on the rise people starting to understand what nfts are and oh by the way here comes this piece uh by slime sunday that's speaking to what this all is and then and then off you go man so i mean now let's do a little bit of the fast forward so you started to allude to now you'll do it every year right and here we sit on almost the third year anniversary of last Stand in the nation state oh by the way on nifty gateway i mean this is this is an addition that's now two and a quarter million dollars in on the secondary market, not even touching open sea volume outside of Nifty Gateway. Um, this is this has an active offer and a last sold over $2,000. I mean, it just sort of never, yes, it hit the face melting heights of $20,000, kind of what didn't in peak Nifty Gateway era, but it's always just maintained, you know, such a, such a place in collector's hearts um, and has never really even come close to, um, 
you know, to, to bottoming out or anything like that. Appreciate that, man. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if I'll ever capture that moment again in my career. You know what I mean? It's like kind of like one of those just right place, right time, right message, um, which is really hard to do. Like you can try to do it. I don't know, a hundred times in your career and you might only do it once. Um, it's kind of just like one of those things that I don't know if I'll ever achieve again. Um, I don't know, man. I, I feel like there's, I feel like there are some signs that, that you may have something up your sleeve, even if you don't know it yourself. I mean, since then you have gone on to, you've done some more with Blau, you've collaborated with Playboy, you've released plenty of, plenty of additional artwork that's been well-received. And then now you have this anniversary to play with every single year, which who knows? I mean, who knows? It's only, yeah, yeah, it's only yeah. a couple of years into that. Yeah, that is true. That is true. <laughs> so let's talk about how you approach that. So 2020 hits, you release an artwork that maybe over, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe over the course of that next calendar year, going into that first anniversary, you realize, holy shit. I mean, this is something like, this is something special. Like you, you did capture that moment. It's been well received. What's the decision like going into the first anniversary to say, hey, I'm going to I'm going to honor this. And exactly how do you do that? I honestly I think the first anniversary, I, I wasn't like prepared to kind of do anything. It kind of just came up so quick because I'd been like focusing on everything else that was going on. And I was like, holy shit, it's already been a year. Like I didn't even realize that a year had passed and it just came up super fast. So. The first anniversary was kind of like, all right, we'll do the Sativa State, which was like two of my most popular pieces at the time, which was Mona Sativa and um, Last Stand. And I kind of just like morphed them together into one piece and animated her. And I was like, all right, this is the the first year anniversary. Um, so that that just came up way too fast. I didn't really have enough time to like think about it just because the space had been moving so fast. And then... The second year anniversary, I actually put like, I was like, all right, it's coming up. Like, I need to figure out like what we're going to do for this. And that's when we did Revenge of the Nation State, which was like kind of the beginning of the fall of, you know, what has come to this point. Um, we had the FTX stuff and, you know, Gensler was starting to make an appearance. So I felt like that, that piece kind of, did a better job of capturing what was actually going on in the time. And then this year it's like, I've been spending, you know, the same, same amount of time as I spent on revenge to really think about like, okay, here comes the anniversary again. Let's make another piece. That's going to actually capture what's, what's going on. So I feel like now that I have this time to really focus on, on the artwork and really make a, you know, prepare for it, you know, months in advance, it's like, I can actually do something um, that is powerful and meaningful for, for the community. The in-between, right? Year, year zero through, through what's about to happen. What are a few memories or anecdotes from, it either could be around one of the anniversaries, around one of the artworks, just something memorable along the way, whether it was something someone said, something someone did, a moment you realized that something special was going on? Well, a lot of people have come to me and you being one of them and said, Hey, this was my first NFT was, um, was last stand. And I've heard that, you know, like hundreds of times at this point, which is insane to me. Like I didn't realize that it had that big of an effect at the time. And also just people like coming to me and saying like, Hey, I sold last stand. And like, I'm putting my kid through college with the money I've made from that. Um, that to me is uh insane and i and it's helped a lot of people i guess like you know at the time when it was selling for those price points people were making you know good money off it and people had bought five or six of them and you know held on to them long enough and they're able to like do something positive with with the money that they earn from it so to me that's pretty powerful and you know a reason why this piece is so special to me number one being like so many people this was their first NFT and, and so many people have made, you know, changes in their lives because of it. So I think just like honoring it year after year is something that's important for the space. And, you know, I, I don't know, I think 
I hope that's a good answer. That's a great answer. Has, has it ever made it made its way into the hands of anyone surprising that just caught you off guard? Like I remember Griffin, one of the Cock Foster brothers, I think he had collected a whole bunch of them um, out of the gate, but any, anything along the way, either that artwork or even revenge. I mean, you probably would know better than me if anyone interesting has, has bought it. I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to think, uh, I'm trying to think, I think what John Michelle of, of Ledger, right? He, he was yeah, in there, yeah. but yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to go back. We'll have to go back. Yeah. We'll it, have it, to take a look. It really, it really had developed an insane community. And I think it's hard to keep track. It's hard to keep track of who came in when, um, obviously there were some people who did sell them and put their kids through college at a certain point <laughs> yeah. in time. So it's hard, it's hard to track, uh, the, the current populace. I'll have to do a little case study of, of who, who yeah, has the current. That too, Cause I, I never really like looked at who was collecting it. I still, to this day, like, don't, I need to do a better job of like seeing who's collecting my work. Cause I honestly, I mean, I know the people in my discord and stuff are, cause I talk to them frequently, but outside of that, it's like, it's hard to. A lot of times people are just anonymous, so you have no idea who's collecting the work, you know? So true. So true. <laughs> so, all right. So we get to present day. So we recount, right? We go back to 2020. You release an artwork that would change the annals of NFT history. The next year rolls around. It, I don't think anyone slept that year. So you're completely forgiven for the anniversary sneaking up on you. You combine two of your infamous pieces, right? Release that artwork. That was a limited, that was what? uh 40-ish editions it was something yeah. small yeah and it was basically just available to holders at that point yeah i remember crossing my fingers that day and, and striking yeah. out it is what it is yeah <laughs> then we move on to the to the next year the second anniversary you're better prepared you release revenge of the nation state to, to great acclaim i remember that being an artwork that was talked yeah, about we a lot three yeah uh, and i forget what the time limit was it was like seven seconds or something We'd had it for free for seven seconds or something. And yeah, there, I guess there was like 2000 people on the site, basically exploded the site. <laughs> I was sitting in an airport on airport Wi-Fi and I was right there ready, hovering over it, ready to buy. I clicked buy, it gave me the spinning wheel of death. Uh, and then, it, and then in, in two or three seconds, it said, confirm you're not a robot. And I went through the conference. There wasn't enough time. And then it said, nope, you're out. <laughs> yeah, that, that was, uh, I think we did it too quickly it's all good i mean hey so, sometimes you need you know sometimes it's like that sometimes it's it's limiting an artwork that would go you know for, for many more editions but uh what i mean that's over 700 yeah which is in that short amount of time i mean could have been a lot worse could have could have been like who knows like 2000 3000 <laughs> so true and i remember you did that at a really interesting time like you said there were some things that had fallen apart and I yeah. think that was such a cool lean in, such a fun lean in at a moment where I think some people needed it. In fact, I remember that being one of the narratives at the time, like how how great of Slime Sunday to do this now when, yeah, again, everyone needed to pick me up. Yeah, it's tough. Like a lot of times you want to do things that are going to help the community. And, I, and I've been doing this over and over, um, like even with, you know, the Great Purge, it was like, let's do something that allows people to, you know, burn everything that is to them like a rug or just something that didn't go well for them. And, you know, you can get a slime Sunday piece. And like, in, in that situation, like so many, I think we burned like, I don't even remember the number it was over, might have been over, it was over 50,000 NFTs burned for sure. Um, but yeah, but a lot of those times, like, you know, it's, you're basically putting out a lot of artwork. Um, and, you know, like from a, from the standpoint of, is this artwork going to be worth something in the future? Who knows? Like when you put out, you know, 4,000 pieces, it's like, you know, anyone can get one if they want one. But it, to me, the, it was more about like the message and, and doing it for a reason that meant something over like is this artwork ever going to be worth something in the future and that was kind of the plan with revenge of the nation state as well it's just like trying to do a pick-me-up because times have been so rough lately and give people something to you know like look forward to i've been really a lot of times get asked for advice and a piece of advice i've been giving out and i think it speaks to what you just said is in the worst of times if, if every wheel fell off 
if someone would ask you, you know, hey, why'd you do that? Like, like, how could you do that? And if even in the worst of times, you could look back at that person and explain very clearly exactly why you did it and, and be convicted in that, it's probably a good thing to do, you know, yeah, r- regardless. Yeah, totally. So I, I feel I feel like you have those kinds of reasons when when you put your pieces out. Appreciate that, man. All right. So now get to the juicy stuff. We have an anniversary coming up. It's the third year. What's in store? So actually this year we're going, we're doing a lot more than what we have done in the past. In the past, we would do like a kind of one day event around the time that Last Stand was dropped. This year we're doing it on the exact day. We're starting it on the exact day that Last Stand was dropped and we're kind of doing a thing that's open for a week that is, there's going to be like a lot more rewards for people that are, that are holders. Like so if you have a last stand, you'll be eligible to to purchase the print, which will only ever be released once. Um, and I've done like a bunch of test prints for this and figured out like exactly how I want it to look, like the type of paper I want to use for it. And, you know, it's going to be signed, numbered, all that stuff. And then we're going to do an open edition that's, open just for holders um, before everyone else gets a chance at it. And it'll be for $40. And then there'll be a public version of that open edition that'll be at $120. Um, and then my favorite part of this whole thing is we're going to, we're doing a larger scaled version of the print. So I think it's going to be 26 by 36 inches. I got, I brought it to this place, Oliver Brothers, which is a, a place that is an art restoration place, but they also do like framing and they're actually the oldest, I think they're the oldest like art restoration business in the United States. Wow. Um, So I brought it to them, got a custom frame, looks insane. Got some museum glass on there. And yeah, so that'll be available only. I don't, I got to figure out, like we still don't have the details 100%, but it's going to be, 24 basically a 24 hour auction that's going to be edition number one um of of last stand in the gilded frame um i have it at my house it looks sick i don't even want to sell it at this point <laughs> like, and the auction winner is slime sunday <laughs> i know exactly <laughs> i know it's like i want to hang it in my own house well um, I, I find it so fun that you went the physical route in addition to the other things planned uh, I, I feel like now with the year over year legacy, this this artwork is building up. It is fun to see it take that shape, especially I think physicals have in general picked up some some attention lately in, in the space. I think more and more people are experimenting with the crossover, um, you know, t- taking a digital only piece and doing a, a limited print run. We saw uh, Dave Krugman open the the print shop for drip drops. Like we've just seen a lot of exploration of that of that crossover space. So I'm glad you're doing it. I feel like this is the right piece that warrants it. One of my big questions, you mentioned the frame shop that you chose, but when it comes down to the paper, you referenced the paper, when it comes down to the sizing, when it comes down to the framing and the glass, can you walk us through how you make those decisions? I mean, when, so the framing of the piece was like super important to me. I wanted it to have that, you know, that appearance that it came from the past. I mean, obviously this is a very famous painting. It's hang- hanging in the Louvre, you know, like, um, so obviously I looked at that and I was like, how was it framed before? Um, and look, like not a lot of places do this type of framing. It's such like an, you know, it's, it's, it's basically reserved for those pieces that were created hundreds of years ago. And, more people nowadays have all these modern frames and you know it's kind of out of style so i had to find a place that is still doing this type of framing um and it turned out the place was the next town over and they're like the they've been around for this long you know framing pieces and they're one of the old i guess the oldest in the united states which is you know on their website i went in met with them talked to them and while i was in there they were they had like a, like a Picasso sketch that they were restoring. And I was like, Oh shit, this place is legit. (laughs) So I was like, I'm like, I'm definitely choosing this place. So yeah, I did, I did that. And um, 
then i mean i'm looking at all the glass when they they showed the different versions it's like you know the glass that you choose is like very limited on reflection so i walked in front of you know all the different versions of glass they had and i was like all right this is we're definitely going with this one uh we're going with the ex most expensive one um <laughs> And then the paper, yeah, I did a bunch of um, test runs. And I actually, so for for the piece that's in the frame, I modified, the like spent some time modifying the version a bit so that it actually looks like a painting. So I textured it in a, in a different way from, you know, the digital piece. And it has like, if you, if you look at it close up, it looks like a legitimate painting. Like the paper is very textured in a way that, you know, like offsets the the print you know so it's like if you run your hand over the paper you can feel like the texture and everything um and the effect that i applied to the piece itself actually makes it look like a painting so just everything about the the physical feels like a real you know like painted piece so um yeah pretty sick i'm, I'm stoked on it like i spent a lot of time like researching and finding the right way to do it so yeah. And the other thing that we didn't mention is people have been asking about ban from the internet for so long. Like, do you have any versions left over there? So the, the winner of the auction is going to get my artist proof version of ban from the internet, which is like, basically like, like I said, when I tested out all these prints for, for last stand, I also, you know, when I created the book, I had artist proofs come through. So I have an artist proof that signed and, that's got, coming with it as well so we're kind of like it's kind of a historical slime sunday moment i guess you're getting the the book and last stand so yeah pretty stoked on that i'm so glad you mentioned the book that was another fun process i remember the the lengths you went to produce that book yeah. i remember some of the different things you shared out the boxes to cut out like so much went into that and I think yeah, what I'll probably to... never do it again. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least, well, at least it's behind you, right? At least it's behind you. Dude, now, that was, that was the most stressful, like production of my entire life. Like, I'm glad I had a team. I have a team now, but at that point it was just me like dealing with these multiple book people. Like, yeah, it was, it was a damn process for sure. So that, if I remember correctly, was it was 261 editions of Uniswap. Do you remember? Did you so did you do straight up 261 books plus the artist print, or was it a, a little bit of a different number? Yeah. So yeah, we did. That's exactly what we did. But we also had um, at the time we sold one of ones as well, and with the one of one, you got a different version of the book. It was like a it was a, a much bigger version of the book and it came in a big red acrylic box. Um, so yeah, it was like trying, I, I mean, the people that I worked for, for to, to create the cases of the book or, you know, like I had to convince them to work with me because they were doing like um, this place, it's called um, Architectural Plastics. So they don't like do books. They do like, they go inside people's houses and build these insane like you know casings and displays and they do they do displays for museums so they're like why the fuck would we want to do a book you know like but i really just wanted to work with this place because they're you know they're amazing at what they do so i basically had to convince them like guys i'll like i'll do whatever it takes for you guys to like produce this case for me um and and they crushed it yeah it was a bl blue transparent i may or may yeah. not i may or may not have that book maybe maybe more than one that's right, dude. You do. You probably, yeah, I think you didn't. You get like four or five of them. Just two. Just two. Just two. Yeah, two, I, gotta, okay. I got. I got to call it like it is. Can't pump it up too much. <laughs> yeah, but but such a fond memory. You were one of just a few people at the time who did really really high effort books, right? It was you. I remember Bill Ellis went all in on yep. like just having to see it through. I remember how hard it was on his end as well. You guys were just you know two of a few crazy people at the time. I mean, books, I didn't realize until I made a book that it is way more challenging than you think it is on surface level. You're like, oh, I'm just going to create a book. Nope. It's not like that. It's like, you're going to spend six months of your life, like talking to multiple people to get this thing into like your vision. Yeah. Lots of components. Very, very challenging for sure. Lots of components, lots of components. So now this book comes with the physical, with, with the number one edition of the last stand print. 
yeah the so the auction whoever wins the auction gets both gets the um the artist proof book and then they get the frame version of uh last stand at a much bigger scale than the prints so the prints are i think let me check real quick i think we're doing 15 by 20 that could be yeah 15 by 20 yeah 15 by 20 and then the the frame version is 26 by 36 so much bigger it's exciting yeah dude very exciting and that'll be i mean i mean after that there'll be no more you know like last stand prints that's it so i mean that's an interesting you know that's an interesting declaration how do you feel about that you feel good about that just saying hey I need to give you certainty of what to expect. This is it. Whatever happens, happens. And then yeah. we, we move on to the next step. Exactly. I mean, I think there can only be one ever version of this in a physical form. And, you know, that's that's all it's going to be. Uh, whatever happens, happens. If 20 people buy it, then there's only going to be 20 prints of Last Stand. So, you know, it's like, that's it. That's fun. That's fun. I, I always appreciate getting that level of certainty one way or the other, by the way, if, if the other answer is, Hey, we'll do iterations at different stages and, you know, it'll sort of just keep going. And that's cool too. But I, I always like hearing that where it's like, Oh, Hey, this is going to be the run and wherever it ends, that will be the number that exists. And then we will we'll find something else after that. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, how I feel about it too. Is like, and, and in my, like currently in my career, like I'm exploring more physical stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, st I'm staying linked to NFTs forever as however long they exist, but also I want to expand my physical practice as well. Um, and I think going forward in the future, it's going to be important to have physicals because at this point with, you know, with AI and everything, which I'm using, I love AI. Like, I think it's very cool. Um, and it took me a while to, to come to that realization. Like at first I was frightened, like, what the fuck? Like, but, you know, it's like, it's, it's easy to produce an image at this point. Um, so I think the importance of having a back, a backup physical practice will be increasingly important in the future when digital things can be created so easily. Yeah, for me, I mean, everything that you're doing, every anniversary, every, every step outside the anniversary is your legacy prior to NFTs as well. I, I feel like that builds up, for me at least, such a strong case of provenance. And I think that's, what it becomes all about, right? If, if AI gets better and better and can replicate, I still do think the human element, you know, this was produced by a human, even a human aided with AI, but essentially the Slime Sunday stamp of provenance and authenticity, there really can only be one, right? Only one of those things. And you you make that decision every time you put that stamp on something, hey, this came through me. And I, I don't know, I just feel like for those with a built up legacy, that will matter an awful lot. Appreciate that, man. So take us into your mind when it comes to future years, right? Not, no guarantees, not writing any of this down, nothing is certain, but is there anything? And of course, you know, you, probably some stuff you have to keep to yourself, but at the same point, anything you can share on where you want to go in the future for 2024, 2025, the 10 year anniversary and, and, yeah, and on and I, on. I, I had this crazy idea to like somehow make a sculpture out of <laughs> like a full scale, like big ass sculpture. I don't know if it'll ever happen, but it's been in my head. Like, is there a way to make this a sculptural form of this? Like, you know, like a statue. So I don't know. It's been, it's been in my head. I don't know if I'll sell it ever, but it would be sick to make, like just to have, like, who knows? Maybe it's like it in nifty gateway headquarters and fucking 10, 10 years or something. <laughs> Well, you know what that reminds me of, um, or not reminds me of, but it, it, where it piques my interest, Sam Spratt's project, the Monument Game, uh, in Which collaboration is. with Nifty Gateway. Yeah, just like an, an incredible endeavor, um, such a long time to, to build that out. But that code is now open source. And when you just said what you said, the first place my mind went was to an exploratory, you know, if, if it did take that three-dimensional sculpture form, the ability to get into the layers of characters that you've, you know, that you've placed in there, that you've modified all, all of the story anecdotes of time and place. I think that would be pretty wild. That would be sick. Yeah. I gotta, I, I mean, I mean, if you have some ideas about that, let me know. Cause I definitely want to do Like, I don't know if it would be 
like number one i know like know for a fact sculptures don't sell for the most part and unless you're like a arsham you know like then his his stuff will sell but like sculptures just in, in general are very difficult to sell so i don't know if i would want to do it at, like for sale but it would be sick to do it and in, in in the way you said like and have it have this exploratory element where people can go and view it you know like maybe in vr but it it's housed somewhere else type situation um that would be very cool it's amazing when you really get to thinking, especially when an artwork picks up such traction like this one has, when you really get to thinking about it, it's amazing how many di literally different places you can go with it, different experiences you can give the person, right? From from ultimately a, a 2D presentation, right? Modeled after an infamous painting in the Louvre, like you said, and then, you know, you taking it and then combining it with another one of your really well-known artworks and then taking it and riffing off of it, then taking it and making it physical, than possibly taking it and making it experiential. It's pretty wild. Yeah, I think that I think the experiential thing will have to be in like the 10 years. Cause that's that that's gonna take some time to build for sure. No doubt. <laughs> very, very true. Very yeah. true. So what else, man? So you know, I I sort of boxed you into the anniversary here, right? Because obviously the time and place, it's here, man. I'm jazzed about it. I know you've put so much heart and soul into into what you're delivering for it. But how about outside of that? How about outside of the anniversary and all, all the other things you're paying attention to? Um, yeah, so I I started a like a side project for and, and you know the story of, of Grind Monday, which was my my Twitter handle at the very beginning of for about a year actually, because some somebody had stolen my name. So for a while I was Grind Monday on Twitter. But I also just like for you know, for years I felt kind of pigeonholed into my own style which was you know my slime sunday style which is very well known on you know like on the internet and you know people expect a certain thing from me um so this is like an opportunity for me to explore different styles of art and still keep slime sunday intact and not mess with it you know like i think it's important if you have a style to to stick with it and you know, like that's your style. That's that's what Slime Sunday is. So yeah, Grind Monday is just a way for me to experiment a bit more and and try some different stuff out. And it was important for me when I created Grind Monday to have that link back to Slime Sunday. So, you know, like I started, you know, I funded the account from Slime Sunday, contract from Slime Sunday. Um, so there's still that provenance element there that slime Sunday is the creator of um grind monday so yeah i mean at, at this point i only have two pieces that i've released through it and it's just kind of something i'm doing when i have some extra time to really like sit down and explore new stuff um so yeah that's been fun for me i created an instagram account for it so there's like experimental stuff for that and yeah it's kind of like taking on a new a new form kind of i really like the storytelling your, de your decision to lean into the Grind Monday story, which like you said, lived for a little over a year, right? Because someone did steal your name. It's more special that way. You already yeah. you sort of had the story in your back pocket. And then as you wanted to branch out and explore, you pulled it out of your pocket and you made that the literal, literal exploratory account. I find that even more special from a provenance perspective. Yeah, and I mean, actually Grind Monday has existed before twitter like it was always like when i would make so i made a tumblr back in the day and the name for that was grind monday and it's, it still exists like you know so it's it's been a while around for a while like anytime i didn't want to use slime sunday like to make an account for something i would just write you know grind monday so it, it's like always been a part of slime sunday in a weird way um always linked there you know like slime sunday grind monday it's kind of like the alter ego of Slime Sunday. <laughs> Perfect. We love an alter ego. <laughs> and it, it has to be comforting too, especially for yourself where art is, as you described it. And I, I think I threw the word in, but a sanctuary, right? Where you're able to do it day in, day out. You're able to use it as an escape when and where you need to. And it's kind of, it's kind of always there. Um, is it comforting to have that other avenue that if you do get frustrated or maybe one one day in particular slime Sunday feels like ah, I can't I, I don't want to do this today that you have another place to jump off to yeah 100 percent. and it feels like I'm less like less restricted I have more of an ability to explore because 
I've, I've felt for a while that Slime Sunday is kind of set in stone. Like that style has been claimed. Um, not many other people are doing it. So it's like, it's its own thing. It exists by itself and I don't want to mess with it. Like I, it took me a while to build Slime Sunday to where it is and I don't want to interfere with it in any way. So having this other avenue to like do whatever I want and explore with whatever style I feel like is really, is very comforting. To, to have that how would you describe it by the way your slime sunday style i mean outside of collage like well one liner or or a couple lines that you give someone and say hey this, this style that is set in stone it's it's very provocative and outlandish and um <laughs> like attention grabbing like and i think a lot of it came from at the time like how do you stop somebody in their tracks when their people are scrolling so quickly um and that was my way of doing it, I guess. Um, getting people to focus on your art and stop and say, what the fuck is going on here? You know, it's like our the, the way that our culture is at this point is it's like it's very difficult to get somebody to look at something. Um, yeah, it's I just do provocative things, I guess, to get, to get people's attention. <laughs> I've always appreciated that. I'm trying to think of some specific artworks. There was an artwork of yours that I believe you had released on Maker's Place. That was a fascinating one for me. There was the Phillips show in which you did a couple different things. Um, I remember you would actually come on Origin Stories to talk about Cake Face, and then you executed Cake Face and I executed at yeah. Phillips. That was incredible, <laughs> incredible to see. But I have to say, hearing you describe it that way, your artwork has stopped me at multiple points in time. Yeah, and I think that's that's a goal. And the other the other thing that slime sunday was kind of born out of was this this aspect of ai before ai was even this big thing but you know like meta had already built a, a system in place that detects things and says we're gonna ban this so i was like is there a way to get around this ai and not have it figure out what i'm creating so it's like replacing certain elements of the body with other things like it's for, for instance like if I replace that with cake, is the AI going to pick up on it? So it was kind of a, g a game at the time of like playing with the AI and seeing if it can figure out what I'm what I'm making. But obviously, a human looking at it knows exactly what they're seeing. But an AI might just be like, "Oh, this is food," you know, like it's. <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah. Actually, on that note, since it has been a minute and uh, and on a different show, can you just briefly describe the cake face story? Yeah, so we so I had ha had this idea of, on consumerism of like eating, like we're eating people, we're consuming people, like you know, like when when you're looking at advertisements, it's not just the product, it's somebody else with the product that's trying to get you to buy the product. So my idea was like to use this beautiful model and have her face turned into cake. It's like it's quite dark. <laughs> the piece was quite dark. Um, but yeah, I was talking about it on your show before I even knew that I was doing the Phillips thing. And I, had, for years, probably two or three years, I had tried to create this concept and it never worked. Like just anytime I tried to make it, it looked like shit. So we did like a full blown shoot with everything in place, everything that I needed to make the the work how I wanted. And yeah, it came out, came out really good. Um, and it's funny when Phil when Phillips, I think they did some advertising around the show, and there were so many reactions from people. Like, you know, people were very angry with the piece. And to me, that was a win. You know, it's like if if my if my images are getting you to react in a way that you're so angry with the piece, then I've I've done my job. I've gotten you to like experience something through through looking at it. So and then there was people who love the piece, but the people, I, I always love the people who get angry with my work because it's like, I'm, ma I'm obviously making you like feel something, you know, that show was, um, that show was pretty exceptional from the standpoint of how much diversity there was within it. Like each piece had its own story. You, like you did multiple innovative things within the context of one show at Phillips, you had the hard drive, Right, which had some of your old files. You had Cake Face, which again was years in the making for you and having like wanting to bring that into existence. You had the ban from the internet piece, which which what as as something got banned, how how would that piece go? Yeah. So every time 
I got censored, the piece got uncensored. So eventually it's going to be, you know, it'll be a fully nude piece, but right now it's still um, covered up in parts. It's, it's taking longer than I expected. And it's partly because Instagram has gotten more aggressive with saying what they're going to do to my account. So I've been kind of laying a bit low, but I mean, I'm still like releasing like the provocative stuff, but I mean, every once in a while I will get, I'll get banned for something. Um, it's actually been happening on Twitter quite frequently. Um, not like shit getting deleted, but getting covered up. Uh, what's that? What do they do now? They like, they cover your shit up. Um, they put like a filter over it that says this, I don't know. But yeah, that's been happening on Twitter. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's still, it's still got a ways to go for sure. And when we, in, in the piece, we said it might take months to years. It's turning out to take, it's, it's going to take years. years. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I feel like there's, there's something about that where it becomes an event every time that something happens to extend the piece. And it's fun to see. So Slime, as we, as we lean into the future of art, which is the title of the show, I'm going to ask you a question from an interesting perspective. Now that you have three years of legacy built in, much longer in, in obviously your art career, but I'm specifically going back to the, the anniversary that we find ourselves at in time and place. We're at an interesting point in the market where if we look back to the year 2020, when you released Last Stand for the first time, the market was beginning to show signs of pickup and actually then aggressively picking up into a, a pretty all-time bull run, right? We... Maybe, you know, some people are speculating, have we hit the bottom? Are there green shoots? Are, you know, are, are good times ahead? Some people speculate that's now, some in six months, some in 12 to 18. Either way, we seem to be getting closer and closer to a, maybe a similar time. So what I'll ask you is this, if you were to speak to an artist who's releasing art in the here and now, what would you tell them if they release a piece that starts to pick up some steam, pick up some heat? in kind of the type of moment that you experienced in 2020, is there anything you would tell the younger self and or the person who's releasing that today? Um, I think what I've learned, you know, from being here for three years is that things can change quite rapidly. Like you can be the hottest thing, have the hottest piece that's out right now. And, and in two months, it might, you know, not be that case anymore. So it, it just seems like everything moves very quickly in, in NFTs. So not focusing on that is very important. And also just like, I feel like going back to what I'm saying about like having meaning behind, behind what, what you brought up is like, just do things with intention, like have a reason for why you're releasing something. Don't just release something because you feel like you haven't released something in a long time or just felt like you need to read it. To release something like always have intention behind what you're doing and i think that that aspect will you know in going into the future people will, will recognize that great advice who should be on the future of art it's a good question man there's so many so many talented people I always say not to the detriment of anyone else, right? Not not to the exclusion of anyone else, but who's just that first name that comes to mind? Um, so do they have to be in the NFT space? No, no, not at all. So there's this artist that I've been collecting a bunch of a bunch of her work. Her name's Bella McGoldrick, and she's like a, I would say, hyper realist. Similar to somebody like a, a CJ Henry, which is also like, she's, she's big. She's doing Phillips stuff and, and stuff like that. But I don't know, man, I've been, I've been fascinated by people who have the ability to look at something and like draw it to absolute technical precision. Cause to me, that's been something that I've never been able to do. So I'm just fascinated by people who have that ability to translate something so accurately lighting reflections like everything so so perfectly um yeah that's who i would nominate Either i like one of them. i like suggestions that cause me to go on a different path of exploration yeah so cj henry and bella mcgoldrick are people that i've been you know really impressed by lately um so i would i would say those two people hey i think they're both actually australian as well nice 
All right, man. Well, you gave me a couple rabbit holes to go check out. 100%. All right, my friend. So listen, this episode obviously coming out just before a very special date. Anniversary date is November 6, 2020. November 6, 2023, you kick off a, a multi-day. You've earned it. You take as many days as you want. Kick off a multi-day stretch involving new art, physicals, a very, very, very special, larger, as you said, oldest. Was it the oldest? The, the... It's like the oldest art restoration company in, in the United States, um, which is insane to me that it's like right down the street. But I, I mean, I do live on in New England, which is a pretty you know, there's a lot of history here. So kind of makes sense, I guess. Well, man, thank you for spending the time. We we cannot wait to see you walk all this forward and we'll be paying close attention throughout. Thank you for having me, man. I mean, I have only good things to say about you. I mean, you've been here forever and you're always just promoting and you're, you know, like just really on the side of the artist, which is tough to find. Appreciate you, man. Onward to the future. Let's go, dude. <laughs> Thank you for listening and for being part of the future of art. If you liked the episode, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite platform and onward to the many conversations that await us. The Future of Art is produced by Artifacts. Artifacts, A-R-T-I-F-E-X, was created to honor today's top digital fine artists in three dimensions. Each artist's one of one work of art becomes a collectible 3D sculpture and centerpiece of an immersive world built in Unreal Engine, the creation tool of Epic Games. Search Artifacts Viewer on Apple and download our brand new free app to experience the sculptures in augmented reality. And visit artifacts.art slash unreal to literally step inside the art on your browser.